But to start off, you guys are the privileged ones to be here in this intimate session with this absolute legend. We are thrilled to have our opening speaker for today with us in Madrid. First time speaking at South Summit, first time speaking in Madrid. Um, with the theme we have this year of the Disruptors Playground, we couldn't possibly have wished for a better disruptor. This guy has been building and changing and creating industries. Sorry, I was just talking about one of my absolute idols. When we were dreaming about actually having, who could we have at the Disruptors Playground this year? And we were dreaming, and we like to dream big, and this name came up immediately thinking, we're never going to get him. How are we going to get this guy to Madrid? This guy is so demanded. This guy is such a legend. We're never going to get him here. But sometimes dreams come true. And our opening speaker for today, I am thrilled to announce, is Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. Nolan invented the games industry before there were even consoles. Computers were giant blocky yokes that were only used for programming and work. Can you imagine? This guy is so creative and so disruptive, he had a totally different vision and use for these wonderful machines, which introduced the world of video gaming and later on into Atari. It is with extreme pleasure that I have the privilege to invite Nolan Bushnell to the stage, please. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Hey, you know, I got to tell you, we were so rocking out backstage, it was like a disco back there. You guys are great. I, I, we got to give you guys another hand. Hey, you know, Insanity is way underrated. We really want to have a little more crazy going on because that's where we get innovation. When you do a new business, it has to be a little strange. And so breaking rules is really part of it. Kind of like parking, you know, anyway. Let me start out by talking a little bit about the early video game years. I started out putting myself through college, working at an amusement park. And yeah, they were kind of this kind of stuff. And, um, but I knew the arcade business. I knew how much machines cost. And then I went to college and I had some classes from this guy. And this was one of the first guys that decided to hook computers and TV screens together, video screens together. So in some ways, I was a, an accident. I was the only person that understood amusement games and computers at the same time. This was the first PDP-1, this was the first computer that had a video screen connected to it. A guy named Steve Russell, well, maybe I'll go back a little bit. Willie Higginbotham created a game of ping pong on an oscilloscope in 1958. It was just a demo for a, a lab open house, but he's credited with actually doing the first video game. You thought it was me. No. I was just copying them. And then Steve Russell in, uh, did a, uh, in 1962, did this computer space. Now, I saw this at, at the engineering lab at the University of Utah and was mesmerized. And I said, if I can put this game in my arcades at the amusement park, they'll make money. But then you divide 25 cents into a million dollar computer and the math didn't work. So I sort of stored it away, graduated from college, started working in an industry, and one day across my desk came a cheap computer and I said, maybe now is the time, and it was. I licensed the game to a company called Nutting that did this, this machine before, and this is what we came up with. This was a uh, fiberglass cabinet. I modeled it out of little modeling clay, and, uh, and it was a modest success. We did a couple of million bucks. Um, and then we did Pong. And there, there are actually two innovations here. One is the Pong game, 
And the other one is the polka dot shirt. Um, the polka dot shirt did not catch on, but, uh, but Pong did. The guy that actually wired it up is the guy with the beard on the far end. His name's Al Alcorn. And he was a recent Berkeley graduate. And, uh, and Pong was a training project. We didn't think it was going to be viable. But it was, and it really helped launch Atari. Magnavox Odyssey did a game similar at that time. And then we did Pong for the home. And that really did great. And then we did the BCS. And that became a monster. So we did several of these things. And then I sold the company in 1976 to Warner Communication. And they totally screwed it up. Big companies didn't really understand it. But we did a lot of these kinds of businesses, or different games. And then I did Chuck E. Cheese. You probably over here haven't heard of Chuck E. Cheese that much, but it's a place for kids and games, and, and we have large mechanical robots that sing and tell jokes and things like that. Now, for, since we're talking about startups, think about going to a venture capitalist and saying, wait, I want to build a pizza parlor that's 10 times bigger than any pizza parlor you've seen, and we're going to fill it up with games. But wait, there's more. We're going to have large talking robotic animals. Pretty hard pitch. But it worked. And right now there are 620 Chuck E. Cheeses all over the world and, uh, and growing. Then I did a company called Androbot, first ro personal robotics company. That company actually failed. I lost a lot of money on that one. But uh, it turns out that, that the robots didn't want to work well. This, this was in, you know, when a robot doesn't work, it's, it, you could look at it as a technical strike. This one was a really good one. I did ETAC, which is the first automobile navigation company. If you do Google Maps or, or Garmin or any of that, it's actually based on all my basic software. And did a first shopping system called Buy Video. Did a company called Magnum Microwave. Axon, which is a toy company. Uink, which was a restaurant that had touchscreen ordering at every table. And then today I'm working on Brain Rush and global VR and doing some great stuff. What I want everyone to think about right now is unlike any time in history, you can create a company globally from wherever you are. In a lot of, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking of starting your own business, have already started your own business. You are as likely to be successful in South Africa, Australia, California, Norway, as anywhere else, because the internet democratizes businesses in a very important way. So we want to encourage you when you're looking at your business, think globally. A lot of entrepreneurs, they think, gee, if I could just go to Silicon Valley, it would be a lot easier. It's not. Right now, it's important to save money. And the, the reason is, is that before you're doing anything, you have a whole bunch of costs. Right now, Silicon Valley probably costs you between three and five times more money per unit output than here in Madrid. So stay here, do it. And plus, 
you, you have a, a real advantage here because the Spanish-speaking market has an interesting culture, and it's a very large market. Most of South America, Mexico, half of California, all speak Spanish. And so there's a really big opportunity that I think you have here in Madrid in the startup community. Entrepreneurship is defined as organize, organizing land, labor, and capital for an enterprise. And I tell the joke about, you know, starting a company is really, really hard, but at the same time, really easy. You need to just do. You wake up one morning and you say, I am going to start a company. Now you may start out just making your own job. And in fact, I really recommend that. Start something on the side where you are directly interfacing with the consumer and selling a good or a service. That is the first step away from earning wages. Make your own job. But when you do start, the first issue is to choose your team with care. Your team becomes the seed crystal. And if you have a defective member, that defective member of your team will replicate yourself, themselves when the company grows. The other thing, focus on the business. Most entrepreneurs focus on the product first. Like today, let's say you want to do a mobile app. A lot of businesses want to start that way. There are half a million mobile apps out there. And so even though you may have a great mobile app, nobody knows it. Nobody knows how to, how to find it. And so it's almost better to start out thinking about how am I going to break through this noisy world in order to do it. Focus on the business. I also suggest a hollow company, the one-pager. What is the one-pager? The one-pager is the definition of a product or a service. The one-pager on the front has a picture of the product or the service, the price, and it has to use really big type. And it's the hook. Some people call it the unique selling proposition, the USP. But the whole idea of, of the front is to get a person to pick the, the one pager up and turn it over, where are the details. This is your product spec. But you start from the marketing standpoint. So if you're really clever, you take that one pager and you go to a potential customer, and you say, do you want to buy one of these? This is essentially what Kickstarter is doing. You're selling a product before it exists. And, that, and, and the Kickstarter is the web equivalent of the one pager. I know a company that does about $30 million, and it has two employees a husband and wife team. And what they have is one skill. They have good taste. They go around and they see objects of art, you know, that are in, you know, uh, swap meets and various things. And they put it in a catalog and sell it. They have none of them. They just have a photograph and a price. The ones that they sell, they then get fabricated, some in the United States, some in Thailand, some in Hong Kong. Then they have it shipped by containers to a facility 
a warehouse facility that breaks it up and ships it to the other, uh, to the customers. They then have a company that keeps their books and they do $30 million a year to employees. It's the ultimate hollow company. Kind of cool, huh? And they started with no money and now they're living in, in Aspen, Colorado in this 10,000 square foot house on the top of Ski Mountain. It's a good life. This is the one pager. Creativity. How do you get a good idea? The best ideas come from wanting to invent the future. I, for one, read a lot of science fiction. Science fiction has the benefit that there's a lot of creativity without worrying about the actual truth or the technology of what's going on. But very often, if you know a little bit about the technology or a little bit about process, all of a sudden you can say, that's really great. Yeah, I think we can do that. Like, a lot of the stuff that I do is because I want to live in the future. I want to live in the, in the have this resources and, and things that are going on in, in the future. I think that, that so much of what we're doing with our kids in school is silly. Like if you look at reading lists of most high schools, it's like you're preparing students for life in 17th century England, which I don't think makes sense. Anyone who's ever had a shower has had a good idea. The difference is what do you do after you get out of the shower? The, one, the people that make the difference are those who dry off and start working on their project, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, but now. Now is what you have control of. And so if you have a good idea, work on it now. Have you ever heard somebody at a cocktail party say, Oh, that guy stole my idea. It wasn't your idea. It was not your idea. And they say, well, I had the idea. I said, no, you were a lazy shit. You didn't do anything about it. It wasn't your idea. You don't own an idea until you work on it. If you don't work on your idea, you're, it's just a daydream. You don't have any ownership until you perfect that ownership by activity. You've got to research it, you've got to work on it, you've got to actualize it. Anyone who says that somebody else stole their idea is a schmuck. Just don't even let them deal with it. A lot of young entrepreneurs come to me and they say, I want you to invest in my company. And I say, what, what, what kind of market research have you done? And they said, well, I, I, I've looked at things on the internet. And I said, well, where, where are you going to be marketing it? And they say, well, it'll probably be here, there, what have you. And I said, have you been to a trade show that you would attend? Do you have a list of trade shows that you will attend? Do you have a mock-up? Do you have all the other marketing things? There are so many people that want to work on a product and they have done no research. They don't know what they're doing. Did you know that at Google you're not allowed to say I think? You're only allowed to say the data shows that. So if you have a new idea, you have to put research and that of similar things or something that would be appropriate because it's about an analytics-driven world. Today, most people still go into a conference room and try to make, up, make a decision about something. Smart companies ask questions. 
because so much of it can be tested on the internet. So much of, you know, should we do this product in red or green? <coughs> and it turns out that try a web page with the product sometime in green, sometime in red, and see what the response is. Don't try to decide. At Atari, we had two commercials that looked pretty much identical to me. And we decided to go one more step and to test them against, against a population. We tested one in Kansas City, another one in, in Columbus, Ohio. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and the thing about it was we couldn't tell the difference. But one cleared the shelves and the other one did nothing. What if we'd have decided in our arrogance that this, the wrong one was the right one? We'd have wasted $3 million of advertising. Wasted it. Test, 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 test. When you're trying to get ideas, sometimes doing a table. What do you mean a table? Well, you list all kinds of businesses or products, and you look for holes in those products. You know, what, what box is not filled in? So you maybe plot cost of DRAM against cosmetics or you mash things together. And you use plots and graphs to predict trends. Like a lot of times, certain businesses like YouTube <coughs> didn't make sense until the cost of, of bandwidth was low enough. And you can predict that by trends. This is DRAM prices. Did you know the Atari 2600 had 128 bytes of RAM? because RAM was really expensive. We knew that in two years, when we actually put the product into production, that we would be able to afford 128 bytes. Two years later, we could have, we could have afforded 10 times that for the same amount of money. Right here, right today, there is a 50-50 shot that the next Apple or Google or Yahoo is attending right here. Now think about it. You say, but, th but this is Spain. How can that be? Well, like I say, it's global. And by thinking different, and the most important thing you can do, really, is to believe in yourself. Optimism is the precursor to success. There will be a major, major company that will come out of Spain in the next five years. Statistics have it. Are you the one to do it? It's really... It's really up to you in a lot of ways. Now is the best time. This is the golden age of entrepreneurship. Why? Capital is more available for startups than ever. That's one. Two, time to prototype of both software and hardware costs, in many cases, one one hundredth of what it cost a few years ago. You can bolt together chips to make an internet of things in a day. That used to take months and years. Now you get a Wi-Fi chip, you get a single chip micro, you put it together, slap together a little software, and even software is modular, where you can get a little bit of code here, a little bit of code there, wrap it together, you go from an idea to a product in faster time than ever. And remember, 
How much does a company startup cost? It's the time that you take before the product is in the market. And before you even get a product, all you have to do is do a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo or some of these other crowdsourced crowdfunding structures and you sold out. A good friend of mine, Elon Lee, did a, did a product, a little stack of playing cards called Exploding Kittens. You guys know this story? Raised $8 million in a month for a little stack of cards. He already had them designed. What a great idea. It's the golden age of opportunity of entrepreneurship. You need to get a skill or define what your skill that you already have and focus on it. You assemble a team, get the major positions right. And sometimes there's some technology involved, but you've got to get all the pieces. Get experts and advisors. I get asked probably three times a week to be advisor. I can't be an advisor to all the companies. And man, do I get, do I get approached by some really bad ideas sometimes. But what if I'm wrong? I've been wrong a lot. Did you know that I turned down one third of Apple computer for $50,000? I had a chance to put the very first dollar into Steve Jobs' company. Steve Jobs worked for me. Did you know that Steve Jobs actually, Steve and Steve, and Steve Wozniak never worked for Atari, but he always was a shadow to Jobs. And I had him do Breakout, you know, the, the, the game balls against brick walls. And so when he decided he wanted to start Apple Computer, he came to me and asked for me to invest. I turned him down. I regret that. <laughs> no, I, I actually regret it a lot, but that's another story. But we can't live in woulda, shoulda, coulda land. Find a project, start locally, Think about the Spanish language. I think, uh, you know, you guys have a very unique culture, mindset. And remember that Pokemon was very Japanese, and yet it became very successful. Like, I'd be willing to bet that there are several Pokemons right in this room today. All you have to do is pick out your phone, look for them, and then you've got to catch them with those little balls. Let me show a show of hands. How many people have caught Pokemons here? I have, I have about 12. <laughs> That's not because I'm not good at it. It's just that people look at me strange if I try to do it. You've got to move quickly. Ideas are fleeting. Projects are fleeting. It's really an important thing to make it happen. And there's another reason for it. When you're moving quickly, things develop and don't get too locked into where you're going because when you get into business, you're mixing it up in the business world. You're having fun. You're, you're listening and you're talking. My dad always told me, at a sales call, what's the most important thing you can do? Listen, because listening, the most important skill set for sales are your ears. Try to figure out a way to understand what your customer wants and then lie and t tell them that that's what you're selling them. And then you, may then you modify the product so that it's the truth. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a trick. Fake it till you make it. Um, this is a caution. Most of the startups that I've seen that have failed have failed because of this 
principle. A lot of people believe that you have to have an absolutely perfect product. And they won't actually go into business until, that, until their product is perfect. And they say to themselves, I wouldn't sell a crappy product. I don't want to, because you're close to it and you see the defects. But I can trust, I can say that I have seen more companies fail because of this insistent on perfection than people who have sold something that was not quite perfect. And the way you get out of that mindset is you say, we'll fix all the deficiencies in the Mark II and sell your first ones as beta versions. It gets you out of that conundrum, you get you into the market, and you get going. Because you want to refine, improve, listen to the market, make it happen. And then plan for your exit. You say, but I want to grow old running my company, and I'm going to be a magnific magnificent CEO. The problem is you'll never raise money unless you can exit. Because while you may want to run your company forever, your investors do not. And so if you don't think about the exit, and in fact, you might even start when you're trying to raise money to talk about your exit plans. That will give the investors confidence that they may be able to get their money out. Because putting money into a company is really easy. Getting money out is much harder. Try to partnership. Today, competition isn't as cutthroat as it was many years ago. There are ways that you can partner with things that people that look like they may be a competitor. Partnerships are very important. Try to reduce risks. In creativity is as much about reducing risk as possible. My offices, I always paint the walls with blackboard paint. And, that's, and that makes it really possible because with chalk, you can erase it. And so my offices explode with creative thoughts on the walls. And uh, it's, a, it's a way to minimize risk. Let's see, how do we get to attend word trade shows? I'm out of time, I'm sorry, I'm running along. You gotta embrace the crazy. We, in, our trade, in, in our creative sessions, I ask for big lists of ideas. The more lists, and then you can basically squeeze out of your group maybe 10 really good ideas of new products or features. And then you ask for 10 more. And you start, and they say, well, you know, we're kind of out. And I said, no, let's go for the crazy. And you get another 10. Then you turn the list upside down and you say, okay, these are the crazy ideas. Now let's figure out how to make them work. The crazy ideas. Invariably, the crazy ideas represent the biggest innovations. And when you change your hat and say, okay, this is a crazy idea, but I have to make them work, all of a sudden, your perception changes and the crazy ideas become possible. You can mash together products and industries. You know, for example, what do you do when you mash together a guitar and, and a tube of lipstick? That might be a new business. What do you do when you put together a video game company and a, and a uh, and an exercise -al. I actually did one of those one time. It was Pac-Man on an exercise bike. And, uh, and when, you, uh, when you would be chased by the, the ghosts, you had to go faster. It was actually kind of fun. You get to edit, you know, good people, you know, great, great people, copy. Create feature matrices, foreign travel with leisure, neurogenesis. Let's see, I've got to go through all these things. Do it now. Thank you very much.